I think everybody needs to come here. Um, this is going to be a very biology focused uh, talk, so if I lose you at any time, please let me know and I'll explain um, any concept. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, my dissertation um, work about the ectomycorrhizal associations in tropical mountain forests and its connection with tropical monodominance. So, we're going to have a brief introduction about what is, what is a mycorrhiza and what is tropical monodominance. And then we're going to talk about uh, what is the ectomycorrhizal fungal communities associated to monodominance or ammonia and we are going to talk about the, how these ectomycorrhizal associations can um, modify nitrogen cycle uh, to facilitate monogamy. And then some conclusion. So what is an uh, uh, ectomycorrhizal or a mycorrhizal in general? Uh, it is a symbiosis between a fungus and the roots of the plant, where uh, there is a mutual benefit. Uh, the fungi help the plant to absorb nitrogen from the soil, and also water, and when they transfer that to the plant, the plant gives the fungus uh, some carbon in terms of sugar that they can, uh, pro they can produce by photosynthesis. Uh, so there are two main types of uh, mycorrhizae. One is the arbuscular mycorrhizae, uh, which are, is the most ancestral mycorrhizal association, and is uh, the one that is found in most of the terrestrial plants. About 80% of the plants have this type of mycorrhizae. And also, they form two main types of uh, structures, uh, vesicles and arbuscles. Um, these are the main exchange. The arbuscles are the main organ where the exchange of nutrients and sugars happen. These are in the phylum glomeromycota, and they have, re they have relative low diversity, about 240 described species so far in 2013. Uh, the ectomycorrhizae is the other, other type of mycorrhizae. They're associated mostly with trees. And um, there are not a lot of species that have this type of associations, but they are mostly in these, uh, in these tree families. And they form two types of, of organs, the mantle and the heart net. And they grow only around the cells that don't go inside. That's what I call ectomycorrhizae around. They are mostly in the Basidium mycota and Ascomycota phylla, and there are thousands of species uh, that form this type of fungal species that are in this type, form this type of association. So what we know is structure the ectomycorrhizae, so we're going to focus mostly in ectomycorrhizae, but I'm going to talk a little bit about our as well. So what influence the ectomycorrhizal community are two main factors. And first is the plant host species, so different host species and families would influence the community, so if we're going to find a different ensemble of species, depending on the host plant species. And we also know that there is a turnover in the species composition, according to varying with soil types and also with inorganic nitrogen availability. So these are just some examples comparing the community composition between soils with sandy texture and with plated tex um, texture. And this is also comparing communities um, across a nitrogen availability gradient. So they, this, they, the species change. So what is monodominance or tropical monodominance? So monodomy, tropical monodominance is when the tree species accounts for species. 60 or more percent of the basal area or the number of individual species in a forest. So this is very normal in temperate forests, but this is special in tropical forests. Um, it's special, it's different because most tropical forests have a very high diversity. At least 20 to 3 species have been reported as forming monodominant stem in tropical forests. And this is, this is somehow take the mechanism from controlling plant species um, abundance in tropical forests. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later. So these are all the species that has been reported as forming monodominant in tropical forests. And we're going to focus on Oromonia mexicana that are mostly in Central America. So the classical example of monodominance in the tropical forest is the Hypercarpathian family, 
that forms monodominant stands in the dominant forest, mostly in Southeast Asia. But in the neotropic, there are also some monodominant species that have been very well studied by the Simbecorimbosa or Comparinidae Turkey, both in the Guyana Shield. So people have been trying to explain classical monodominance, and you can notice it's a complex <laughs> phenomenon. And so many, many hypotheses have been proposed to explain this phenomenon. In summary, um, the mechanism proposed to explain monodominance has been lack of disturbance, mass fruiting, and escape from sleep predators, put through this poor seed dispersal, escape from herbivory, low decomposition rates, leading to low nitrogen availability, ectomycorrhizal networks, <coughs> and positive plant fulfillment. So most monodominant species are ectomycorrhizal. So in tropical, tropical forests are mostly dominated by arbuscular mycorrhizal associations. So 94% of tropical trees are micro, arbuscular mycorrhizal associations. But 40% uh, of the 22 trees species that have been reported as monodominant form ectomycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizal associations. So we think that has something to do with the fact that they achieve monodominance. Um, but the mechanisms behind, behind it are not fully understood. So, oh, sorry, I went back. So I tried to test some of these hypotheses, and my study area was in Panama. Uh, in the west of Panama, very close to the Costa Rican border at the Burkina Forest Reserve, which is a primary lower mountain forest. We have mentioned here at 19 and 22 degrees Celsius, and it's a very rainy place, 69 meters of rain per year, and soils are relatively unfertile. So, my focus is the Ecuadorian Monastic Panama, which is a Julian Daisy that forms ectomycorrhizal associations and is distributed in South Mountain Forest from Mexico to Panama and it forms monodominant stands, but those stands are surrounded by arbuscular, arbuscular mycorrhizal dominated forest. So this is how Oremonia dominated forest looks like. Uh, and then my first um, chapter in my dissertation was to characterize the ectomycorrhizal associated to Oremonia in this uh, Panamanian forest. So we have um, a very good uh, system to test the effect of fertility on the assembly uh, of mycorrhizal community. So we have two sites, two, two or four sites, two in hypertrophic sites and two in low fertility soil. They both, they all are dominated by, by Oremonia Mexicana in a gradient of in a, in with high differences in nitrogen, phosphorus, pH, and, and cation exchange capacity. And then in, in, two, in two sites per level of fertility, we collected roots of four adults and five cities. And, uh, per adults, we collected one adult, seedlings, and saplings, and we replicated the, these in all the sites for a total of 198. Um, individuals of the species. And we tested some hypotheses about the effect of soil fertility on the ectomycorrhizal communities. So we have criticized that the percent of mycorrhizal infection is going to is going to be lower in sites with high fertility because the plant is less dependent on mycorrhizae. We also expected to have lowest species richness in high fertility because the, the fungi are not as abundant. And we expected to have different Position. We also expect it to have a strong environmental filtering in sites with low fertility because, because the environment will filter a lot of, will select for species that are adapted to low fertility. So what we found uh, is that actually there was lower percentage of infection in sites with high fertility compared with low fertility. Um, yeah, <laughs> we also found that our ammonia associates with a very diverse <coughs> ectomycorrhizal community. This is a typical inverted J uh, distribution with a lot of single tones and only very few species that are very abundant. Um, and the most abundant OTs 
belong to this genera, this gen the genus Rufusula, and they, the four more abundant otillus were, were mostly shared between adults and siblings of, of the same species. So these colors represent which, which species or otillus were found in the in, or development of So we found that actually Rusula is what the most abundant genus um, associated to Remuli, and this makes sense because it's one of the ectomycorrhizal genus that evolved in, evolved in the tropics and then um, moved to temperate forests, so it makes sense that it's very diverse and very abundant. We did not find any significant difference in the species species between high and low protein types, opposite to our predictions too. But we did find um, differences in the species composition associated to our ammonia high and low protein um, types. So we have here the low fertility size grouped together and the high fertility size grouped together and they are different based on an Adonis analysis. We also found that um, this is of the genus Rusula. When we put it in a phylogeny and put on and test which ones were in, in high fertility sites and in low fertility sites, the species that were associated to low fertility sites closer together in the phylogeny, and the species that were associated to high fertility sites closer together. <laughs> so they share less evolutionary history than expected by chance. Is this based on DNA sequence? Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. I actually so got out of the From the root samples, you, you took this DNA out and you saw Yes, yeah, we took. Okay. Actually, this, this tree was was done based on fruiting bodies and also. Did you do that tree as well? Yes, yeah, I did the tree. And, and then you looked you mapped your root exactly. samples on. Yeah, we color coded um, mm -hmm. the tie, and those are our, our root tips and fruiting bodies collected. Yeah, this is probably have any other question. And we just found that well, evolutionary, um, the species associated to high fertility environments were significantly different than the ones that were associated to low fertility. So what can we conclude or uh, conclude our, our hypothesis? First, percentage of infection was not supported. From the opposite <laughs> trend, we found highest infection in high fertility. For the species richness was not supported. We found equal richness in high and low fertility sites. And also, we supported our hypothesis about different conditions with difference of fertility. We also supported our hypothesis about environmental filtering in the community. So our conclusions is that our ammonia <laughs> associated to a very diverse uh, ectomicrobial community of fungi and there is a very high turnover uh, among soil types. And also the Rusula was very abundant genus and also show um, significant differences in the phylogenetic, their phylogenetic composition inside with different, different soil types consistent with mitochondria. So then we tried to test hypothesis to explain why our ammonia will achieve such monodominance when <laughs> other species are very, very so, well, the title kind of says our conclusion, <laughs> but I'm going to show them how we get to it. <laughs> so, tropical forests are renowned because of, of the high, high diversity. So, uh, on hectare, Panama tropical forests have between 70 and 153 species. But the most tropical forests have between 300 and 400 trees. That compares with a temperate tree in Illinois, temperate forest in Illinois that have between um, make us wonder why one species of tree doesn't outcompete all the others and dominate in, this trop in the tropical forest. So I have a lot of hypotheses trying to explain why. Uh, this high diversity in tropical forests is one, and how this is maintained. But Janssen and Collins is one of the strongest hypotheses uh, that says the negative density and distance dependent effects caused, caused by natural enemies can regulate abundance. 
to basically a seed that dispers as far away from the mother as possible will suffer for less less um, effect of pathogen uh, and will have higher chances to survive. And then that's one of the main mechanisms um, uh, to, to maintain a high diversity. A more recent hypothesis, which is very, very close to that, Johnson and Cohen has funny a hypothesis with the plants of feedback hypothesis. That is, um, so plants with feedbacks occurs when a plant is able to modify the material contained in the soil. So a negative feedback occurs when seedlings grow into part or to species of the, to an adult of the same species can suffer from a uh, higher abundance of even specific pathogens that can have negative effects on growth and survival. So this, uh, in this paper published by Mangan et al, um, shows that in lowland tropical forests, plant soil feedback is very negative and is most likely um, and a strong mechanism explaining the high, the high, the high diversity in forests. For example, here we can see the, the negative uh, effect of, of uh, the strength of the plants of feedback, and then the species with the highest, with the most negative plants of feedback, <laughs> has the lower um, availability, you know, the, the lower abundance. So going back to, to Oremonia, Oremonia doesn't have some traits that, um, that monodomia should have. Oremonia doesn't must, so it doesn't put a very high amount of seeds. It's very well dispersed, so it doesn't have any problems with dispersing. It has leaf functional traits that are very close to the community average, does not cast dense shade, and does not escape from the river. So we are left with three main hypotheses that we can test. First is the presence of positive plant of feedback. Second is the presence of ectomycorrhizal networks. And the third one would be slow decomposition rates that lead to nitrogen too low nutrient availability. Wow. <laughs> There's supposed to be a figure here <laughs> that I copied from a paper. Um, so that's our ammonia shows positive plants of feedback. So as I said before, plants of feedback can occur when a plant modifies the microbial dominates that are in the soil. So a positive plant of feedback is when seedlings grow into a nearby adult tree of the same species, giving slower pathogens and more beneficial, beneficial microbes that could help them move better and have higher survivorship. So we tested the hypothesis that ectomycorrhizal uh, associations could help um, increase the resistance of oremonia in, again, against soil-borne pathogens that promote the plants of feedback. So we will expect that, so we want to compare oremonia with other, the other plant species that have different um, mycorrhizal associations. So we are gonna compare ectomycorrhizal seedlings of oremonia with other arbuscular mycorrhizal plants that cohabit with it in the same forests. So we compare the performance of these seedlings in conespecific soil and heterospecific soil. So in conespecific soil, we expect to have a high abundance of pathogens, of species-specific pathogens, and growing heterospecific soils of, or soil that comes from underneath another species, will expect to find um, low concentrations of species specific pathogens. So in ammonia that we expect to have a positive plant of feedback, we expect it to grow very well on seeds on, on soil that come from other cells or con specifics and to grow and to not grow well underneath other species soil. And the opposite for our species that should be plants of feedback. So <laughs> that's a complicated <laughs> hypothesis to explain. But for that, we have a, a full, fully factorial plant design for a feedback experiment. And for this, we use five of all species. Oremonia mexicana, 
and another electromycorrhizal species were cut up in sickness, and we used three different arbuscular mycorrhizal species, Guarea, Copania, and Nectandra. So we grew them in six different treatments. We basically grew each species on its own soil and in the soil of the other four species, and also in a sterile substrate. Uh, so we replicate each one in ten, each one in its own soil, and the sterile soil, and the other species soil for a total of 204 experimental units. So for example, for one species, we have 48 plants, and this is the number of, of plants in each treatment. <coughs> so the results from this were opposite to what we expected. We saw that Oromonia mexicana has the strongest negative feedback. So when a grow Oromonia is on soil, it has very bad growing rate. <laughs> And even that, some of them. <laughs> so it was totally, totally opposite. But what's interesting was to see that in the mountain forest, we can see the same patterns that have been found by mangan in lowland tropical forests. So when we compare the species abundance in the forest versus the strength of, neg of, the, of the negative feedback, we found Oremonia was also <laughs> very strange because even though it has the strongest negative feedback, it has the highest among the forest. And the species that have the less negative feedback has the lowest amount. This is still <laughs> why? I don't know. <laughs> so our real hypothesis was rejected. Oremonia doesn't show any signs of positive plant for feedback. So our second hypothesis was to check if Oremonia can form ectomycorrhizal <laughs> networks. So ectomycorrhizal networks are common my mycorrhizal mycelium linking the roots of at least two plants that allows inter-transfer of compounds. So it's basically a fungus that through its mycelium, mycelia is connecting two different plants and transferring nutrients between them. It could be it could be nitrogen, but mostly carbon. So one plant that is, for example, growing in shade is going to receive carbon from another plant that is growing in full light. And then the fungus can, do, can transfer those nutrients. So our hypothesis was that in the presence of ectomycorrhizal networks, we're going to have higher survivor chip, high, high growth rate, and higher delta protein carbon. So when a, a, the carbon is transferred from a plant to another plant through the fungi, the fungi modifies the isotopic signature of that carbon, and then the, the carbon signature in the, in the plant you can tell if they are receiving or not carbon from, from another plant or from the plant. So we designed this experiment with two vocalities, or ammonia and ropala. Ropala uh, we chose Ropala because Ropala forms no mycorrhizal association. So it would be a very easy to control for the effect of transplants and other things in the experiment. We also replicated this experiment inside and outside of the forest. Um, so we have disclosures. We have one very fine mesh that will exclude everything from touching the roots of plants. Hyphae, other roots, everything. We have another disclosure experiment that would just control for the effect that we have an exposure. <laughs> so it will, um, it will just uh, avoid the entrance of other roots, other roots. And then we will have transplants that will control for the effect that we have on that plant. And we have an understood seedling control. So this is more or less how it looks in the field. Uh, and we replicated this. 20 times inside Oremonia forest and 10 times outside Oremonia forest. For a total of a lot of replication. <laughs> 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 so we measured the relative growth rate for a, for a whole year. And at the end, we harvested everything. We measured all the biomass. Uh, we measured the, the carbon content, nitrogen content, nitrogen isotopes, carbon isotopes in the ceiling and we also measure all that in the soil. 
So what we found uh, was that actually the seedlings that grew the least were the control group. <laughs> and the seedlings that were isolated were very happy. <laughs> so actually what we're seeing here is an effect of, of lower competition in the structures and the plants were basically no, no, they didn't have any negative effect when they were isolated from the networks. So this, and the same thing, more or less, was seen in Ropala. So we concluded that <coughs> probably they were not depending on mycorrhizal networks. So we also found, which was very interesting, was when we compared the same results but inside and outside our ammonia forests, Ropala have a very um, lower, a lower growth rate inside our ammonia forest than outside, <coughs> while our ammonia they have significant differences in its growth rate. However, the mortality of our ammonia outside was very, very high. So these are the results only from the, from the seedlings that survive. So basically they have opposite results. Or ammonia grow very bad inside, oh no, sorry, Ropala grow really slowly inside or ammonia. And or ammonia die a lot, a lot high mortality outside or ammonia. So this is what I was uh, telling them, telling you about uh, the research in Carbon and how we can use this uh, pro as a proxy for connection to my Bison networks. So this is the um, data in Carbon in a host tree, fully fully photosynthetically post tree. And then we have an autotrophic understory plant. We have a fully mycotertrophic plant that is receiving 100% of its carbon from fungi. And this is more or less the signature that we were expecting to have in our ammonia. Something like mycotertrophic or at least that was receiving something. Uh, when we compare among the treatments, we didn't find any any difference in, in the data carbon. So that corroborated our conclusions that there were in fact no microbial levels going on. We compared the same thing for delta 15 nitrogen and there were no differences either. So our second hypothesis was rejected. No effect, there was no presence of extra microbial levels in our system. So at this point, I was about my four year <laughs> <laughs> and I really need to find a good hypothesis to test. So luckily, in 2013, we looked at from University of Indiana policy paper, which is the nutrient, uh, the mycorrhizal associated nutrient economy. So they found that nitrogen cycle was very different in ectomycorrhizal dominated forests compared with a nuclear mycorrhizal dominated forests. Uh, and this was given um, by, different, by different things. First, a nuclear mycorrhizae are not able to absorb organic, organic nutrients or organic nitrogen from the soil, from the soil while ectomycorrhizae have the capability or the enzymatic capability to absorb organic nitrogen from the soil. Also, in arbuscular mycorrhizal dominated forests, fungi uh, and bacteria um, biomass in the soil are more or less equal, but in ectomycorrhizal dominated forests, fungal biomass is way higher than, than bacterial biomass. And also, they found that the, the inorganic nitrogen pool in arbuscular mycorrhizal dominated forests was higher. And in ectomycorrhizal dominated forests, the inorganic nitrogen pool in the soil is very low. So this was a very good timing <laughs> to say my dissertation. <laughs> and luckily, we have replicated our experiment inside and outside the ammonia forest, so we can test this hypothesis with the same data that we have. So we hypothesize that ectomycorrhizal fungi compete with satrophos, satrophos, satrophos saprotrophs for organic nitrogen inhabiting rates of decomposition and nitrogen plantation. So in ectomycorrhizal dominated forests, we will expect to have lower inorganic nitrogen availability, lower delta-15 nitrogen, 
which is a proxy of nitrogen cycling in the soil. And we are going to expect our arbuscular mycorrhizal species to have a lower, lower growth rate. So this is, we took this data from the same experimental design or in the exposure experiment, but we measured nutrient availability inside and outside and was compared using two data sets. Data sets. Here's the soil variables. We measured nitrate, ammonium, phosphorus, thermal nitrogen, car carbon nitrogen ratio, delta 15 nitrogen in the cold soil. And we measured also things building. Some variables in this is nitrogen 15 nitrogen, delta 13 carbon, uh, leaf tissue, and percent of organic rifle colonization. In the same, same site, the discussion experiment was set up. So, delta 15 nitrogen um, is a proxy of the amount of nitrogen cycling in the soil. So, basically, transformations in the, of the nitrogen in the soil used by the micro, microbial community. And gaseous losses give us a modified delta 15 nitrogen and soils with higher rates of nitrogen, therefore, higher availability of inorganic nitrogen or have higher delta 15 nitrogen compared to soils with lower carbon, with lower nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen availability. So, with this in mind, we compared the delta 15 nitrogen in the bulk soils inside and outside of ammonia forest. And we found that the delta 15 nitrogen inside was lower than the delta 15 nitrogen outside or in the arbuscular dominated forests. But also, we found that the total nitrogen inside the ammonia forest was higher. Um, and the soil carbon nitrogen was lower. So, I'm going to show you this before and then I'll show you my conclusions. However, when we look only at inorganic nitrogen, we found that inside or ammonia forests, nitrate and ammonium concentrations were, were way lower than in our soil mycorrhizal dominated forests and also unreified any differences in phosphate. So we found high nitrogen in the soil, but that light nitrogen is mostly only. Uh, organic nitrogen and the inorganic nitrogen is very depleted and the nitrogen cycling rate is lower inside the moon. So we look now at the plant, delta 15 nitrogen, and we found that seedlings growing outside or ammonia seedlings growing outside have lower nitrogen percentage in, the, in their leaves. So even though there is Higher inorganic nitrogen concentrations or ammonia have lower nitrogen in their leaves. And also, the plant has higher delta 15 nitrogen in their leaves from outside compared with inside. And also, we didn't find any differences in carbon, and we found differences in exomicrobial concentration. So, delta 15 nitrogen in the leaves of the plant will tell me a lot, will tell me. What is the amount of nitrogen that they are receiving from the ectomycorrhizal fungi? So what we can conclude from here is that ectomycorrhizal is that or ammonia inside was receiving more delta 15 nit more nitrogen from ectomycorrhizae, and that's supported by the higher percentage of ectomycorrhizal plantations. And this plant, even though you are growing in a delta 15 nitrogen enriched soil. They are depleted in the top in their in their in their leaves, and it's because they are receiving all the nitrogen mostly from the mycorrhizae. From the mycorrhizae, from a bigger tree, is the same. No, from the mycorrhizae from the soil. Yeah, because they are not. We concluded that they are not connected to other trees, mm -hmm. but the mycorrhizae is basically absorbing all the nitrogen from the soil and giving it to the plant. The plant is not absorbing it on its own. It's mostly it's depending on the on the fungi to absorb that nitrogen. So we also explored um, the correlation between or ammonia and adult trees and the availability of ammonia, nitrate, total nitrogen, total carbon, and phosphorus 
in the soil. So we have Alfortuna, my PhD advisor has plots of one hectare, and two of those plots are located in one Olimonia monolamina forest. So per each quadrant, they measure the, all, these, all these soil variables, and we were able to correlate all those soil variables with Olimonia abundance in each quadrant. So what we found is that there was a significant correlation between Olimonia abundance, uh, Olimonia abundance, and nitrate, ammonia, and also total phosphorus, but not total nitrate. So what we see here is that probably the chemical rivals only associated to Olimonia are modifying the nitrogen cycle and, and <coughs> depleting the inorganic nitrogen in the quadrants where Olimonia is more abundant. So after all this, we, we came up with this graph, which is a feedback loop, and that's is what we think is happening. So there is a high abundance of oremonia that causes a high abundance of ectomycorrhizal fungi in the, in the, in the soil. These ectomycorrhizal fungi complete, compete with saprophytic fungi in the soil or the nitrogen. So these ectomycorrhizal are just absorbing the nitrogen directly from the organic matter. And the saprotrophs have no, no longer access to the inorganic nitrogen to actually uh, transform the inorganic nitrogen, so it's locked in that biomass. That causes low decomposition rates and produces a reduction in the availability of inorganic nitrogen in the soil, and that increases the survivorship and growth rate for ammonia seedling that is going to cause an increase on of ammonia. So our conclusion is that here the present positive plantal feedback or ectomycorrhizal networks actually explain the monolamina of oremonia in our body system. But instead we found that oremonia can is associated with lower concentrations of soil ammonia and nitrate than the nearby articular monolamina forests. And this reduction is most likely associated to a more tightening nitrogen cycle that could be associated to lower nitrification rates and nitrification rate um, this whole day. So well these are basically the conclusions to the whole talk. It's just easy to get every associated with a very diverse community, socialized a very important uh, genes in our system that has environmental filtering in their in high and low fertility sites. Also negative plants of feedback are dominant in our system and they don't explain uh, monodominance. And also Oremonia forest is associated with lower nitrogen concentrations in the soil. Um, and those lower nitrogen concentrations in the soil are probably associated with a more tight nitrogen cycle. Um, <laughs> so, what are we want to do now? I still have a few minutes. <laughs> so, we want to understand where the functional, functional traits, uh, fungal functional traits. Uh, so, not all the plants, ectomycorrhizal fungi, are equally important to modify the nitrogen cycles. I don't know which are actually the the species or the groups that are involved in this process. We also think that Oremonia mexicana uh, this effect on in nitrogen cycle or in nutrient cycle is content dependent. So we want to know if this is gonna happen when we change soil fertility the mycorrhizal community or it's gonna happen. So that's part of um, the here at the University of Florida. So we realize that in the juvenile daisy family, um, we don't know a lot about mycorrhizal associations of the tropical species mostly. So we, well, it doesn't supposed to be there. <laughs> it's supposed to be here. So we, are <laughs> so we, we know a lot about Eremonia, but we don't know a lot about the other genera that are in the family. So we want to explore the mycorrhizal associations um, in other mostly tropical. 
um, tropical genera in the family. And we also uh, want to understand in this phylogeny, most of the species are ectomycorrhizal, but gene, uh, but gibbons forms a buscula mycorrhizal. Yeah. And it's right there in the middle of the phylogeny. So we want to um, where is the evolutionally, uh, how did, what is happening? <laughs> Why do glands have our buscular mycorrhizal situation? Also, you can, these species are, are very tricky, usually in the tropics. They're highly associated with cloud forests, and cloud forests are very endangered because of lower warming and also because high, high deforestation. Actually, 20% of the species of the plant are endangered by cement leaves, and also all of the species that are in that leaf are tropical. So, and we don't know anything about the type of microbes association. So, creating knowledge about these associations will help to develop um, propagation practices. So, we also want to know in Central America, not in all these types, but in some of the types, along this um, distribution, range of distribution. How the ectomycorrhizal community change changes, and how on what is the effect on nitrogen in on autoimmune versus ectomycorrhizal in the forest. And finally, I would like to acknowledge all the people who helped me. It was a lot of work, and I have a lot of help from a lot of people from from my former lab and Stalin's lab, and all my collaborators in the Smithsonian and at Fortuna Foreign Research. Thank you for listening.